What's going on? Well, this is for uh, John and Texas Flyer. Because um, uh, the geometry linkages situation continues. <laughs> and uh, people keep uh, watching the videos, so I, I think. And, and they have for 23 years, so, you know, I guess there's. I guess it's worth uh, continuing to talk about. So, John, he. He commented a few hours, maybe 10 hours ago, and then Texas Flyer maybe three or four or five hours ago. So um, I agreed with both of them. I put a like on both of them. And, you know, what I was trying to show with that um, Hangar 9 Extra uh, setup, um, it's in the other garage now. <coughs> I guess we could look at these, but... Um, is that, you know, what you guys already, both of you guys have mentioned it, both John and Texas Flyer, that you look into, and, and then somebody initially asked, and I can't remember who that is, um, how do you determine um, where you would put the control horn? If you're building the plane yourself, you know, or, or like me, you're reslotting. And, um, you know, these are a little bit of a lazy reslot because I just went from the factory upper slot and I moved the factory lower slot closer to the edge of the servo body to get the conicals in. Um, but in reality, you know, I mean, if I wanted best case, I'd make both slots and they might have not have the control and I'd have to cut the covering and I mean the hard point and extend the hard point like I did in the uh, rudder on gear. And I put that in a video. But uh, typically, and I mentioned this in the last video, if you line up this ball link with that edge, um, you really can't go wrong. You know, if you have a three quarter arm, one, one and a half, one and three quarter, two, it's all gonna work if you set it up with the conicals, you know, so if you're doing your own thing. <clears throat> but both of you guys are right. Uh, so that's how I would, you know, you know, if I was setting up, uh, if I was manufacturing ARPs, um, for sure, my ball link would be lined up with this edge of the servo body right here. So this whole thing would be down here, and I'd have wide trusses set up for conicals. And I'd be dialed. No matter what you end users did, it would be awesome. Uh, so that, to me, that's very clear. There's no no denying it. Um, there's just no denying it. <laughs> now, on the other hand, does this do these work? You know, even if I had put this truss up higher and had no conicals, of course it does. Like... You know, the Jay Stussy and all the, all those guys flying it forever that way. Um, <clears throat> you know, but yeah, the top pilots in the world were flying uh, planes and setups a million times worse than this. Well, a million times kind of exaggeration. Um, but, you know, worse than this for sure. Heavier, worse, worse setups, worse equipment, worse everything. You know, 20 years ago and, and 30 years ago worse than that. 40 years ago worse than that. So... All this stuff's gonna it continues to get refined and it's gonna still be refined more um you look at this this wing this is from extreme flight and um check out where the aileron um servo locations are you know that's what eight inches from the bottom of the aileron there and that's like 18 inches from the from the tip of the aileron there well um I also have the Extreme Flight Slick, the 114 inch, and I think it's an older design that they haven't, you know, revamped much, changed a lot on. They just did the quick releases. Even that has an earlier version of the quick releases, and um, they have this bottom servo about five inches up here instead of eight, and they have this outboard one, which is going to, you know, make it the tip heavy. They have it about also five inches from the end. Of the aileron out there, so see that they've changed it. Now this to me is a, a lot better place to have them. Um, and you just got less weight out on the tip. So you know they're refining their stuff all the time. Um, I heard from Mike at the Sacramento event. Um, was it him or was it Don Hamp? No, it's Don Hamp. I heard from Don Hamp. He has RC Air um, that he got the new. I said Mike because he's got the new um, Extreme Flight Extra 260 <clears throat> as well. They both have the 104 inch Extra 260. Uh, but Don told me about the assembly. He said the control horns are all glued in, so that's a refinement too. Now they're not in the right place. You know, for me, uh, they're in a plenty good enough place. But they keep refining is the point. And 
they'll keep refining all this stuff too, and it'll get better and better. And, and, um, it'll be more and more finished. And, you know, I've been saying that for 23 years too. And look at now they, they're gluing in the control horns. Um, I think pretty soon you'll be able to, you know, order it with the servos you want, probably at first with the servos they offer. And then, you know, down the road somewhere, you'll be able to order these things and have China do all this stuff. Like, why should we do any of this? You know, of course, the economics could change. Maybe we'll be building these things for the Chinese <laughs> pretty soon. <laughs> but, you know, the way things are today, I've said this for years, like, why do I have to do anything when it's, you know, 20 cents an hour or U.S. over there to have somebody better than me do it? Probably a 14-year-old girl, but she's really good at it. Um, you know, so... And that's lazy. We, you know, it's, it's not that hard to put these things together, but you know, it was four times harder 20 years ago. And that's, that's pretty fair statement four times. So why not make it easier? So that's a lot of hooey. The, what John and Texas flyer said is ultimately true. What I'm saying about having it off, having the ball link line up with the side of the servo body and having the trusses far enough apart to have conicals in them and a hard point there that's needed takes care of all servo arms. So from the pattern flyer to the XA flyer, he's they're all dialed. Um, but ultimately what John and Texas flyer said is true, um, but you'd have to change your control horn location you know, for each plane. So that that's great for custom planes, but it's not great for ARPS. And that is, and it's also the, what I was showing you guys recent, you know, in the last couple of videos, that you're more, more worried about full um, deflection. So I'm running 42. That's a whole other story I want to get to. I tried 38 today, and I did re all these linkages just got redone. You can kind of see the in that hole, there should be some remnants of dried up. Um, Loctite thread locker because uh, yeah I move these over to get 42 I could only get 38 which is what everybody talks about but I don't like no 38 <laughs> 42 is better 44 sometimes but I'm trying to you know pare it down to, to 42 now but yeah full deflection which that's probably about what I got you're looking for a straight push ride and you can see what I'm talking about that this control horn you know I was lazy and not moving the whole thing over it's just moved over slightly because i've only moved over the one truss for the for the conicals so i maybe move this an eighth or three sixteenths which definitely makes this better than it would have been but even better if it was down here and that push rod was straight um so ultimately um texas flyer and john are correct that you know you want that push rod straight even here it's not, you know, so the, the limitation would be maybe right there that you hit. Now that's maybe a little bit more. So that's right straight. So that's going to leave you. And that's, I was just gauging these. That's about 30, 28 to 30 um, on there. So for this to be optimal, even with this fudged over a bit, you know, you're talking 28 degrees for, for an optimal situation. Um, yeah, but those guys are right that if that's where you wanted it, then having your push rod going, pushing straight, I could, I could probably get a little more out of that and still be straight, um, you know, it's, it's going to give you, that's the, at, at the highest point of resistance, you know, from the air, at that point, you're going to have the most force, you know, going against the surface, then you'd want your most optimal angles you know you're pushing here straight onto the surface instead of pushing the surface pushing it at an angle the surface is trying to go this way but in order to get it to go that way you're pushing at an angle this way or uh, you know conversely you're pushing at an angle this way it would be better to be going straight into the to the force against it um, also those angles do other things for you that I always talk about you know in, in this we're getting a a rotational load instead of a pry load which you know tweaks on this tweaks on the output shaft tweaks on the bearing while there's at the case starts to spread the gears gears bind up you know so it all gets loose and then eventually fails um, sooner than it needs to so that I like that for that reason too and then you know a huge reason on all this stuff is 
the proportional linearity, you know, from from here to here, you have pretty proportional movement of the surface in relation to movement of the arm. Whereas, you know, when you start getting into these angles because the control horn's up too high, then you have all this movement here, which is not proportional um, in linearity to when you come back over here. Um, all of a sudden you're, you know, in this area you're moving the control surface a lot for small stick movement. And over here you're moving it a little for a big stick movement. So that's all that stuff comes into play. Um, the two reasons I want to make the video is one is um, to agree with uh, Texas Flyer and John that, you know, the goal would be to have, you know, a full deflection to have the arm straight and um, that'd be ideal. And then the other thing is like why I came to any of this stuff, you know, like it's not like I'm a genius or anything. I just, uh, what happened was, you know, I started 23 years ago and, um, you know, things weren't as good as they are now. We didn't have as good of equipment and all that. And then what guys were doing, like the old masters at the field, you know, the carton, uh, the, the iMac flyers and stuff, they'd, you see it online, you know, in places that you could find people online then. Um, the people talk about, you know, you set up your plane, you get everything like sort of, well, you know, they definitely talked about all 90s. They wanted this at a 90. They wanted these all 90'd out, which is we've been discussing. That's not what you want. Um, but then from the 90s, then they would say, you know, you turn on your radio and um, this is pre-matchbox, you know, um, you'd adjust the push rod length. You know, that's what they talk about to get the servos to sync up. And we'd have two, three or four on the planes that we had on, on each aileron, on each half. And, and um, yeah, they go, well, you push, you'd, you'd adjust the push rod length. And they were trying to avoid sub trim. In the servos back then, you know, if you had a servo, and just like today, owing to the teeth, you know, the where they lined up, um, you know, when they have the, the potentiometer, you know, which generally all these are run on voltage, at the factory, you know, where that ends up, you know, and then you put the the servo arm on it, you know, the, it, it's going to be at varying places. And then, you you know, back then you set the sub trim and then all of a sudden um, it would go like almost no distance one way um, against the sub trim you'd turn it to and then like way distance the other way. So, you know, in order to avoid that, they're like adjusting push rods and all that. And then now your whole geometry is off, everything's a mess, and, you know, I, I wasn't a genius, but I was um, OCD, <laughs> like a lot of us, I think a lot of guys in the hobby do have, you know, some perfectionist, OCD, you know, retentive stuff, they liked everything to look neat, that's the, even why the 90 thing came up, everything 90 degrees, you know, because that, that looks appealing, but um, I didn't like that whole concept, you know, what what the guys were doing, it didn't, it seemed like a good idea to me and then what happened was I wasn't flying very long and then I, I got um, this, this I discovered the high techs um, I think the 5945s had just come out and the programmer had just come out and um, to be candid too on that you know that I was uh, gonna go fly at the XFC I had just flown in the TLC Memorial with Kike and Chip and Jeff Sieber and those guys, you know, so it was fun. And then um, I was going to fly. It was the second XFC. I think there was one in 2002, and this is 2003. So I actually got sponsored, you know, and then um, so I got um, got a box of high-tech servos. And that's when the whole thing happened. So it wasn't because I was that clever or anything. But all of a sudden, um, I, I come with a programmer and I made videos way back then, they're still around somewhere, but, you know, you could take that servo arm and let's say the, you know, you wanted it in this orientation, let's say, um, to get your push rod to work right, and um, you put the horn on it and it was over here, um, you didn't have to adjust the sub trim, you could adjust the pot, um, the voltage on the pot, you know, with the programmer, you could actually spin it to... Uh, center up where you needed it to be and then that way it stayed linear so like it would be uh it would go the the travel the same distance you know let's say it's 50 degrees and 50 degrees off of that so it'd do it very evenly um 
and you could even adjust the endpoints on it too, all with the programmer. Uh, so, you know, you had the situation where you could field program what was only done before at the factory and you had to leave whatever was there. Um, and then, you know, even later when, you know, just a year or two later when the matchboxes came out and then, you know, Smartfly did their equalizers. I think that's got all the names right. Um, I think JR came out with the matchboxes and then Smartfly came out with the equalizers. And then a lot of other gadgets came out too. But the guys were still, uh, that's just a, those things are just a radio extension. So it's just, it's still endpoints and, and sub trims, you know, it, it's not programming the, the servo. So, um, now once, once I had that, um, and saw what you could do with that, then it was the anal retentive thing that came over me and, and, um, I stuck a protractor on and I said you know if I can put this center anywhere I want and you guys have heard me talk about this but this is how it came to be you know this is was the the onus genesis the um you know how it burgeoned and everything was that um you know I saw that I could program a neutral anywhere I wanted so why not make it even so it would be even on the other side of the plane and then I stuck the protractor on and then I think, you know, I'd already kind of got going on the protractors because I was checking all the, I was, I've talked about this before too. Uh, you know, I was checking all the servos on a big protractor with a big wire to see how even they came out of the box, how linear, you know, and how, how, how much this, the neutrals varied and how much that, um, from those neutrals that they were even, you know, each way on, on their travel. And, um, I was finding they were quite uneven on that, and then, but I'd been using the protractor, checking things out, and I said, well, what if I put the protractor on the servo and make that even to where it's going even at the same time with all the other ones? And that kind of got me down that road, and it was all because of the high-tech servos and the high-tech programming. Um, they allowed the, the servos were programmable, you know, and, and that got me going on that thinking. And then I, it really became a big deal um, where... The control horn wires, it really came a big deal, the exact height. Because like even these, we don't, these aren't uh, adjustable. So you're hoping that Skywing, Streamflight, AJ and everybody have these from the center of the hinge line to this pivot point is exactly the same here. And if there's three, exactly the same. But they're not uh, adjustable. And they're super gluing these in and stuff. There's a lot of room for variance. There's, but then it also gets into the offset from the center of the hinge line. And, and most of the manufacturers try to get it right on the hinge line. But there's some advantages to offset too. You just have to have them all the same. Uh, so when I'm building a plane, I have offset. Um, but yeah, you need to match it on each side and that helps you with some angles too. Um, but then, yeah, so I got into, let's make it the same so none of them are fighting each other. and. Then that's when I, you know, discovered that, you know, it, re it really became critical. And I like the Dubro on the bolt, the clevises, because they're fine-tuned adjustable. So I could get this one at 48, 48, it's nice and even. And then this one at 50 and 50, nice and even. But that's the closest I can get them, unless I can adjust the control horn height uh, with a Dubro um, uh, bolt and clevis system. Then um, I could just spin the clevis, you know, one time and I'd get that, um, get them exact so that, you know, they're both 50 degrees, 50 degrees. So that kind of got me down that road. Then I realized, and the first, I think thought that I had was, you know, let's get them to where they're all synced up, you know, and they're all doing the same thing. And then it started to occur to me, well, how good is that? Because I'll have that, I'll do the same thing on the other side. And then when this one's going up 45, that one's going down 45. And then uh, you know, so it'll be equal drag. And then I started thinking, well, how good is that? You know, by having them both all, let's say I had six, three on each side on the ailerons, having them all go exactly 50 degrees from a to be determined center and exactly 50 degrees. And that made the surface either be at center from the to be determined center on the servo arm to exactly, let's say 40 degrees and then center and then exactly 40 degrees again. Then with that being done with the programmer on the high-tech servos, instead of with a sub-trim, um, all the servos 
not only did I have, you know, nothing fighting, you know, I had the the good setup at center. I had the good setup at each endpoint. I had the equal drag, all four positions. You know, one aileron up or down, the other aileron up or down. All the drag was the same. But then, uh, because if you take the time to do that with the control horns and everything, get everything to where you're not just 48, 48 here and 50, 50 here. You're 50, 50 everywhere on the server arm movement. Then you you have the most bind free setup throughout the range of travel. You know, because like, let's say you have rates. Most of the guys have rates. Um, so if your ailerons have different rates, um, then when you set up your plane, you slip to the max rate and then the neutral and then the max rate the other way. Well, now you go to the mid rate or a low rate. The, the, if you don't have this stuff all absolutely perfect the way I do it, like if it's not dead nuts perfect in every degree, then throughout that range of travel from zero to end point, there, it's going to be binding and is it you know you're going to live you know jay stucy lives with it all that stuff they everybody lives with it um but you don't have to have it and how i saw that with mine not only can you do it with an amp meter like these ones from uh Frumco, but um that's kurt cook and mike from and then yeah but <clears throat> what i was able to do on all my planes and i still am um but i am a little you know subjugated to the um control horn heights to make sure they have them perfect. If they're not perfect, mine aren't exactly perfect either. But I could take at any point in the midpoint of the travel, I'd sit there and just go to a third travel, any kind of travel I wanted, and I could pop off all the arms, put all the arms back on, like no arm was binding against another arm throughout the whole range of travel. I do it all the time for fun, you know. To, if you're going to take that much time to do the work, you you have fun testing it out and enjoying it. But Throughout the entire range of travel with three servos on each aileron in both deflection ranges on both sides of the plane, I could take any servo arm off I wanted with just like a breeze. It just pops right off and pops right back on anywhere in the travel because it ain't binding. But how are you going to do that otherwise? Like you you guys, you guys don't have that. <laughs> Let's just be real, you know. Um, Probably, you know, I don't know, everybody who's ever flown or very close to it, um, they, they've never experienced that. They don't they don't have that. Is it fine? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, Juan Sanchez, in our interview, he talked about it and got to kind of listen carefully because we we're talking about this stuff. And at one point he says, well, because we, he agreed on that, you know, the rudder is, is the worst offender. Uh, when I was talking about it, he, he says, yeah, I could see that. Um but he says, you know, on the ailerons, you have this distance between the two. And on these built-up, especially these built-up ailerons that are not uh, foam sheeted, um, there's enough flex in them that if you're off, I mean, you could be off a quarter inch or who knows, maybe more than that, you know, that it, it, it's misaligned on there. Um, and uh, it's just going to flex, you know. And then the servos are so strong now. These 961s are, yeah, I just broke a servo arm on that was only been on the plane like five flights. Um, and, you know, I thought, what broke? The control horn or the servo broke or something? Not nah, the servo arm just snapped. <laughs> it's in the video from the Sacramento event. But with all this good stuff, you know, that we have now, uh, you know, you're going to be fine even if you are binding. You know, that's, that's a, what happens now, you know. But um, is it going to be better if you're not? Yeah, is it going to be better if you have equal drag? Yeah you know and but was it super important and i've gone over this a lot lately but you know 21 years ago it was a big deal um yeah to be kind of candid like the elite pilots back then didn't think you could fly um high tech 5945s in a you know serious competition plane um like that you know the, there was even some of the elite guys, I won't mention their names. I almost did right now just for fun, but no, I won't. Um, that were, you know, really disparaging at the XFC, you know, kind of behind my back. Like they, so I couldn't like, they didn't walk up to me and say it, but I could see it when I walked by, you know, they'd say stuff like, yeah, about the servos and everything. But they didn't realize, you know, those, those babies were all programmed, man. So they were dialed. Um, yeah, I had... For the equipment at the time, you know, because the uh, the best servo at the time was from um, JR was an 8411, and it, it couldn't even, it was not even close, um, you know, in, in terms of if you're syncing up on a wing. Like, if you put one on 
some small plane, you know, just one on an elevator versus the high tech 5945 then. It, it, the 8411 might have been a touch better, maybe. I mean, they weren't that good either. But synced up like we did to make sure you had enough power. You couldn't get them synced up. It wasn't even possible. They were so nonlinear out of the box, and they didn't have any programming. So um, you were never going to have what I had. Um, and so that the long story short on that is um, that is why you know I started going down that road was because the high-tech programmer and programmable servos, servos made that possible to start thinking about doing that type of thing. And then once you get down that rabbit hole, you start looking at all the different angles. And like Texas Flyer and John said, you know, if this, if this is pushing straight, instead of pushing in an angle this way or that way, I mean, the, the, the force you want is, you know, straight into the aileron. You don't want to try to put an aileron that's trying to go that way, and you got an arm going this way or that way. You know, it's not going to be as good. But then there's the other angles too, you know, from straight down and straight side and um, yeah, and there's, you know, how to get your linearity, but at the same time you want mechanical advantage and you want your resolution. I got such good resolution right now on my throttle on the on this plane, the new plane, that today it felt so good. Um, and I have it all on the bottom, which um, Terry Wiles talks about, you know, the first half of the butterfly, you know, to get as many steps of resolution there and then you don't need very many in the second half and if you don't get it right you can um, use your radio too to d just dial in a curve the curves work amazingly well um, as long as you don't put a junk servo on the throttle but is that pretty much enough about that I'm just agreeing with John and Texas Flyer ideally you want it straight how you do that as an art manufacturer line it up right there and put it here so like a whole like five eighths below this one, and then everybody will be dialed. Um, as long as you have room for the conicals, as long as you make the trusses wide apart, um, everybody's going to be dialed. If you're doing your own custom plane, then like the guys say, you know, just make sure that at your personal full deflection, whatever degrees you'd like to run on an aileron, um, that your push rod is straight. You're going to be the most optimal. Do you have to have any of that exactly right? No. Um, is everybody that's doing this different than me fine? Yes. You know, <laughs> do I like the way I do it better? Yeah, a lot better. Um, you know, but, um, yeah, take all that for what it's worth. Then I got a quick rundown on flying this day. I've had a ton of GP 123s and I have a ton this last 16 months I've been back flying. Um, but I, I got on to them um, nine years ago when I was flying. I got a handful of them then as well. And then, oh, and I've just encouraged a lot of my buddies to get them nine years ago and this last year too. I'm like, anybody's getting a, a third scale motor, I'm like, get the GP123. Because, you know, I did try the DLE 120s. I haven't tried a 130, but the weight looks a little bit more than I'd want. Um, and the DA um, 120s and, um, you know, the 3W um, 110 and all that. Um, even, a, yeah, BME 116. But, you know, and I do like the DLE 170s uh, for sure. Um, but the the 120s are fine. They're just a little soft, you know, and, and the DAs... Um, Definitely a close second, you know, for next to the GP, but the GP 123 just hands down. And I thought they weighed like eight ounces more, but lately when I check all the weights, it's just like two ounces more or something. Somebody correct me on that, but not a big deal at all. Um, but it's just so strong, so smooth. Um, yeah, and just runs great right out of the box. And so every single one of them have been identical for me. And this was this one today, too. I, I put a picture up. Today I did the main like 7.30. I got there so late. And um, uh, put the maiden up. And then uh, on the second flight, I went over and hovered it uh, for a picture. For Chris, took a picture of me. So I put that up on the Facebook page. And um, these motors, that's like me, always long-winded. But the... I, I never had one even uh, blink, you know, um, never sputtered. <laughs> like, you just don't have to do anything, you know. You never have to touch the needles. And, and um, 
they just run brilliantly all the time. Never, never had a kickback. Just never had nothing but smooth power and reliable goodness. Um, so that was also what happened today, and that you know happened. Um, I put a couple of those on the trash can planes. I put a couple of those on the Skywing slicks I got um, all like this year, and um, all of it same. And so can't say enough about that. You know, and then it's really nice to know you got Joe Lewis for service and his service so fast and everything. But that was a takeaway from today. And then, you know, one one of the takeaways, the other one was the plane. And especially flying these trash can planes were just just a, you know, a few years old, um, you know, six and eight years old. Some of the trash can planes are about, I think, three or four years old models. Just how much heavy they are and heavier they are and how, how like these these are like the um my also my extreme flight 100 inch slick they call the 105 and a half um it just doesn't weigh anything and this plane does it's just planes just a kite and the wings over here you pick them up you can't even there's just not any weight it's like they're, they're like negative weight they're like feathers and the quality is amazing the only thing that i had to do which i've had to do on third of the plane so far in the last year is um the wing tubes are too tight it's i do hate it because it's so much work you know and i, I would gladly pay china you know an extra hundred dollars and they could do it um so it would be nice to have china do even more stuff but that's you know it's being pretty lazy because this plane went together really fast uh, it doesn't have the control horns glued in like don hamp said that the extra 260 does but for me that's better i get to put them where i want but um but it's still so quick and easy, you know, I mean, that's, yeah, there's nothing we do that's even a thing. <laughs> it's, the, it's so easy. But yeah, this went together super easy. It's super light. And it's interesting, too, you know, that all the planes this last year fly great. Like planes have improved so much, you know, and we're n narrowed down too to a lot less manufacturers. Um, there used to be, you could get bad planes for sure. I mean, you could get planes with problems and now you just can't they're all good and to me they're they're all kind of morphed towards the center like the the laser slicks especially the slicks they don't fly like exactly like a slick used to uh, they they feel more like the center like an extra to me is the center and and the edges too you know they're they're all like uh, fudging scale <laughs> you know a little bit and uh you know heights of stabs heights of wings tapers like everything um so the point is that this is another fantastic plane. It does have, they all have their little tendencies, you know, um, my slicks do feel slickish. So it, for me on a slick and all my slicks do it, um, they'll get stuck on the wings a little bit. They'll, they'll be a little bit forgiving, you know, to where they're happy to fly in the wing. Whereas, um, uh, my extras are much more neutral. You know, they don't care to get stuck on the wing, particularly if you start to roll, it just rolls. Um, so it's definitely, you know, you fly the plane, you know, the plane's never kind of forgiving and flying itself, you know, uh, cause of lift, you know, and, and the, you know, the edges have that straight leaning edge. They, they don't look quite as good rolling to me and they don't do precision rollers quite as good, but that stuff seems like it's been morphed too. Um, cause this does feel, you know, I get that slight edge feel and like the slicks, I get the slight slicks feel, <laughs> But not too much. Like, they just all fly good. The extras and the lasers, to me, still more precise. Um, and, I, you know, I still like those better overall. Always have and still on new ones do. But it's very close now. Like, they're all... They all fly fantastic. 100% fantastic. It's not like one of them flies 90, you know, like 9 out of 10. And the others are 10 out of 10. They're all 10 out of 10. Like, they all fly great. But they have subtle little differences. And this has just a slight edge feel to it. But overall, you know, it just flies fantastic. Um, it's already doing like a few little, you know, I've, it's early days. You know, I put two flights up. But, you know, when I yanked and banked a few times, it um, stick banged a few times. It, it does things just a little bit different. Um, and they looked really cool. But um, I tried to get it to drop a wing and I couldn't. Now, this is also more nose heavy than I'm used to running 
I rode my planes just a little bit tail heavy, not a lot tail heavy, but just a tiny bit. And this one's a, like a tiny bit nose heavy. But I want to see if I can get used to that. Um, because Juan's plane is a little bit heavy, Juan Sanchez Garcia and from Skybound RC. And um, people, you know, everybody that's elite seems to run their planes a little more nose heavy than me. So I'm going to give it a try. Um, but yeah, it, um, yeah, everything felt great. And yeah, I could not get it to drop a wing. And that was a scary thing to do on a brand new motor because it was like, you know, diving it down, chopping the power, kind of doing like half suicides, you know, not full suicide, but kind of half suicide and just seeing if I could like parachutes and stuff, seeing if I get a wing to drop, but I couldn't. So super stable. Uh, I had 37 degrees with the one and a quarter hole on the ailerons. And um, the guys talk about, you know, 38 up, 37 down. Yeah, I think that's what they say that they like. So I thought, well, let me, let me give that a try, but... Uh, I did, you know, it rolled fine. It was fast, you know, especially if you get full throttle and super axial, it started going pretty good, but I just like a little more. So, but I'm trying to scale back from my like 44 is my normal number, but you know, the elite guys are flying less. So, um, I went to the inch and a half hole and I went to 42. So let's see if I get along with that. But, um, this is all outfitted with, um, high tech, um, nine, six ones. And uh, just one on the rudder, one on each elevator half, two on each aileron. And then I have a 9381. They're slightly quicker, maybe slightly smoother um, on the throttle. That's This is what I do on all my planes. So they all have that same setup. And yeah, it's just so nice. You take, take off on a maiden and you just know everything is just going to be dialed. <laughs> it's got the tech arrow, you know. Um, and, you know, I, I know two electronics experts and they're like, dude, you can't filter RF like that. You know, it should be isolated. But it's a triple filter and I don't know how long I've been using them. And everybody else, everywhere I see, they're all using them too. But I've been using them like 16 years or ever long. He, Ed's been around. And um, so, yeah, it's got that going good. I'm on the... Futaba still. I really like to try something with a rotational pod, like pot, like um, gimbal, rotational gimbal, like um, Jetty or Free Sky, FR Sky. They're showing me that that rotates to more ergonomic. Might help a little bit. Who knows? Um, but yeah, still running on Futaba. Still running on the Smart Fly. Um, power expander it's nice that the receiver just plugs right in and then you just plug the wires into the power expander got a big copper bus in there then you got your two 14 gauge leads to your two battery packs oh yeah they're the battery packs and you know so you got a ton of power going to the distribution bus and then it all branches out you know from there to each individual channel um, so that all works I'd like to get maybe get more modernized with FR Sky or Jetty, but I have to check it out and see how that goes. Um, what other equipment's in here? Got my true turn spinner. Um, I had to move the engine <laughs> for that. That was a bummer. I had to put another spacer in, so I was all done. To, I was the, you know I flew it the other way today, but the, these things where are they? They have a like little power. Oh yeah, here it is. So these ones they still like extreme flight. Um, it's got see a little bit of a built up area, and I had kept this gap pretty tight on here. You can see that gap, and with this built up area, it was pretty nice uh, gap. You know, it's pretty tight, but doable. And but I didn't want to use one of those. I wanted to use my true turn um spinner on this plane there's the spinner so i still have to cut that for the prop it's not big enough for the prop but um when i tried it it doesn't have that um built up area on the back so then there was there was no gap that's why i ran it today but it like you could barely get a piece of paper there and it's gonna rub you know eventually from vibration or something so 
had to pop the engine, linkages, I had to redo. I even moved the throttle servo, yeah, tonight. I did so much stuff. Um, yeah, and I, I had the throttle servo with super good resolution, and it had a super good curve, you know, because the way I set it up. But for some reason, I couldn't get enough travel um, to get a low idle. So I every time I came in for landing, which only twice, I... Um, I did uh, brought, uh, ignition kill to get it to stop, you know. So I had to redo all that. So I moved the servo, redid that, took the motor off. <laughs> and then, yeah, then took the wings apart and then re-synced those up, each servo, um, to get 42 degrees of throw. So pretty much had this thing apart. All the work I did take it all apart tonight and put it back together and then oh and then yeah i spent a few hours sanding those wing tubes um i sand the inner tube you know in the wings not not the tube itself i, I never like to take anything off the tube um 41 minutes anybody still with me <laughs> but yeah i hope to get some fuel through this thing today and then you know start ringing it out pretty soon when i feel like it's you know, safe. Um, and with these motors, I always do feel like it's safe, but it gets just smart to, you know, give it a little time to break in. Um, yeah. And shit, man. Is that pretty much all the stories? And I got, you know, I want to finish these projects. I got this thing. It's been here for a year. And this will be real fun to fly, but it's going to take a couple weeks. To get it done, like this took a couple weeks. Then I got the Skywing Slick, which is close. And then I want to do a whole revamp on the the Model Power Pinky. Then I got that new trash can plane, which I'll have to go through top to bottom. Um, oh, and then I got the old, the original trash can plane is back uh, that went into the tree, and now the fuselage is all. Uh, pretty much pieced back together, glued up on that thing. But then I need to cover it. I was thinking just put some pink. I have a few rolls of pink up there. And then, uh, <laughs> so it'll just look totally out of place. The rest of it will be all the, you know, the stock red and white scheme. And then I'll just have this big, like half of the fuse will be pink. But that needs a bunch of work. And then at the end of the day, it's a trash can plane with a DA100 on the front, which was soft and the roll rate wasn't very good. Um, that's another project. So, that's where I'm at. Let's see. There's no way no anybody's still listening because I haven't talked about anything interesting um, in a while here. But, yeah, it's fun today. I hung out with the boys. So, I've got my regular crew, Chris and Alvin, Mark. And then um, um, today, though, Don showed up. So, Don's got the big 125 laser and the AJ um 200z laser um those are both lasers right yeah yeah i think i'm saying all that right so um that was cool i'm not sure i thought there'd be something in, interesting in there to tell you about you should his hands are huge he's pretty huge and then he always flips the prop for me and it's pretty wild it's like it's like having a you know machine starter <laughs> it looks way different than when i flip it um that's seems like there's something else. Yeah, anyway, that's forty-five minutes. Just because I wanted to say to John and Texas Flyer that you're right. Ideally, it would the push rod would be pushing straight into the surface when it was at full deflection, max force against it. That's it. <laughs> All right, man, I'm out.